It's so nice to be around him. This is something you cannot get from the from the video. Sorry, video people, internet is really different when you go to meet and fellowship in real person. Because of the food. Because of the food, number one. <laughs> but why don't we officially open? Let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Indeed, your word is truth and your word sanctifies. And may each one of us, Lord, as we go to your word today, may we be fully sanctified, Lord, and uh, get to know you more and more, that we become more and more like our master and Lord Jesus Christ. So we thank and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Um, well, I want us to have uh, the study of the book of Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes, because during the time when I was in the hospital and the rehab, the Philippine group had been going to the Beatitudes. So now they're going to something else. Then we go to the Beatitudes. And then after that, by uh, the third week of June, we will continue with our book of Revelations. Okay, So there are eight lessons in the book of Beatitudes. But obviously, I'll not make eight. Otherwise, we won't start until two months from now. So what I'll do is the Beatitudes, I'll kind of speed it up and make it only into two parts. The first half now and the next half next week. Then the following week, following week after that is Father's Day. Okay. And then the following week is when we will start and or not start. Continue the book of Revelation. But for announcement, that is as far as the schedule is concerned. And then also on June 22, we have a special day. Would you leave up Josiah, please? And just show <laughs> Josiah to everybody. Where's Josiah. Yes, I am. There you go. Okay, we're going to have a special day. It's a special day for Josiah on the 22nd. So please confirm with Anna and Serene your attendance because we just have enough, uh, you know, lechon for everybody who's coming. If you don't sign up, you are not part of that lechon. Okay. Huh? I don't know. Carpool and yes. Ah, yeah. Okay, on carpool. Also, please let know Sam and Liz if you are going to carpool with them. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, everyone. Okay, now. So, please, okay, if you haven't yet confirmed, please confirm with Anna Serene. We just want to have the, the head count. And there will be other people there besides our group. So be as patient as possible when you get there. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right. And also for some and least, confirm with them if you're going to ride with them. Okay, you can ride with in the van. Yeah, Merle okay. and I right. want to ride with Sam and Liz also. Uh, Joe, you're gonna reserve your spot. Yes, we would Merle and I would like to ride with uh at the Sam and all right. But, all right, so the reserve your spot. Okay. Only eight more. <laughs> All right. Sege. Um I, I will I want us to I will read the whole I will read the whole Beatitudes, but obviously we won't be able to finish the whole Beatitudes today. Okay. All right. By the way, I texted this to everybody and I said go ahead and meditate on it. Anyone, here's a question. Anyone who did not meditate on it today. Matthew 5. Thank you for the honest people. <laughs> okay. okay. So why don't we read it? It's a beautiful verse. Matthew 5, starting with verse 1. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. So what did Jesus teach them? Let's move on. Here now he said, Verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the weak, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the hunger, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. 
Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, as I always say, and also Father Justin have mentioned this last time, it's always good to know the context of the message. To whom was it written? Why was it written? Where was it written? It's very important because otherwise, we will just get maybe one verse and say, blessed are the poor in spirit. Wait, kailangan, you should always be poor in spirit. Is that what it means? Well, let's look at the whole context. First, verse 1. To whom was he speaking to and where was he speaking? When Jesus saw the crowds, so basically he was with the crowd. What did he do? He went up on the mountainside. What does that mean? He left the crowd. He went up the mountainside and sat down. While he was sitting there, what happened? His disciples came to him. Where? In the mountainside, away from the crowd. And there he began to teach them. Who's the them? So whom is this Beatitudes given to? The disciples. Where at? Now the question, why? Ah, why? It doesn't say directly why. But based on what Jesus will teach them, we will understand the why. Number one, this is the point when Jesus was uh, being followed by a lot of group, by a lot of people. But all at the same time, he has been telling his disciples already that he is going to leave. He's going away. He's going to die. And the people are starting to shift their attitude towards Jesus from people who are, you know, yay, hey, hooray. To people now who are starting to hate him. And when you are a follower of Jesus. Who is followed by a lot of people. You feel a superstar. I mean I could only presume. That there are a lot of people who would go to. I don't know to Peter and to John. And say oh, please let me go to Jesus. Please let him touch me and heal me and so on. But at this point it's no longer that way. So people are now turning around. And people are starting to persecute Jesus. And obviously his disciples. You see, it's, follow, it's easy to follow someone when that someone is loved by a lot of people. But when people start to turn around and hate your master, your leader, your boss, then obviously you as well are going to start to feel the difficulties of it. So Jesus tells him what it truly means to be blessed. So before we do that, there are nine times that the word bless is used here. This is not the same kind of bless that we use to one another. You know, Lord, bless the food we are about to eat, or uh, God bless your trip, and so on. Not that kind of blessing. This is the words used by Christ, our Lord, who is God, and says, who are truly blessed. You know, the one thing funny about this is this. Including the disciples, including you and I, and many Christians. We do not understand who are the people who are truly blessed? Sometimes we have this idea that it is so-and-so who is truly blessed because he has so much. Or so-and-so is the one who is truly blessed because he is in a good position. Good looking. Uh, what, what else? Uh, good health. Uh, good... Huh? Et cetera. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that, that's very true, even for us today as Christians. That's always our benchmark of who are blessed people. But Jesus totally turns it around and defines to them who are truly blessed. As a matter of fact, he was speaking to his disciples and telling them, you are the people who are truly blessed. You might not know it. You might not understand it. You might not have a full comprehension of that, but you are the one who is truly the group of people who needs to be super happy. And who are they? The first few verses, yes, we describe who are these people who are truly blessed. You might not understand it. You might not know it. You might not feel it. You might not be smiling, but you are the ones who are supposed to be able to embody what it truly means to be blessed. So that's the background. And that's very important to know because the disciples were having, starting to doubt here. They're saying, did I make the right decision on leaving everything else I have and following Christ? You know, sometimes we can actually regret following Christ. 
Because by following Christ, sometimes you can lose your friends. Sometimes you will start to have new enemies. Sometimes uh, you will even have a broken relationship with your even family members. You could actually lose business because of your uh, attachment and your relationship with Christ. And at that point in time, depends on the gravity of it. Sometimes you tend to say, maybe I just should slow down a little bit. Maybe I just put my one leg on the other and the other on the, on the world. You know, good for me now, I only have one leg. So I only with the Lord. <laughs> but, but that's the point. Sometimes we can have this doubt. And Jesus will try to, in a way, convince his disciples that you didn't make the wrong decision. You have given your life to follow me, obey me, surrender your life to me. You are the truly blessed people. And I would like us to kind of double check our own life and see if we qualify to the qualification of Christ on who is truly blessed. Okay, are ready? Here we go. The first one, Jesus starts with the very, very top, the most important one, verse three. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Who are those people? Jesus is saying here that people who have truly come to a point of repentance, People who have come to a point who knows and understands that he could not make it on his own to enter the kingdom of God, but only through repentance that he acknowledges that he is evil, he is sinner, he is on his way to hell, and there's nothing he can do about it. Now, who are these people? Well, obviously, these are people who are Christians. Because the, the prerequisite to coming before the Lord is repentance. Going to church is not a prerequisite. Did you understand? Did you know that? Eating food there is not a prerequisite. <laughs> it helps. <laughs> it helps. It helps. But it is those who are poor in spirit. So here are the, the disciples of Christ who are with him right now in the mountainside, away from the crowd. And Jesus is, confer and is confirming with them. Look. If you are one of those who have truly repented, I don't have in this computer the, the my underlining. I'm using a different computer, by the way. I want to underline the word or encircle the word theirs. To you belongs the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter whether you are poor now, whether you're sick now, whether you are in trouble now, when you're in a broken relationship now, it doesn't matter. What matters the most that belongs to you for eternity is the kingdom of God. Even Nicodemus, the Lord says, you cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Mm -hmm. And the qualification for being born again is repentance, broken in spirit. The book of Psalms says, a, a person with a broken spirit, the Lord will not deny. Mm -hmm. broken and so, broken and contrite heart. Yeah. Even in the book of Peter, Jesus says, the reason why I'm not coming back yet is because I don't want anyone to perish, but all come to repentance. repentance. So, again, just a reminder for both the disciples here and the disciples right now. By the way, being a disciple doesn't mean you're a Christian. John 6, verse 66. Many of his disciples turned around and no longer followed him. Unless you are a true disciple. Unless you are a true disciple. So, but in general, you would say people in a congregation in a church, they are disciples because they acknowledge Jesus is Christ, etc. But it doesn't mean that they're automatically Christian unless you have first repented. And so the Lord is saying, It is you who have repented who are truly blessed. Not just blessed by material possession, but blessed by spiritual possession. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. You tell me, what is more important than that? Everything you have here or everything you don't have here are all temporal. My leg or my foot rather is temporal. Doesn't matter. The Lord comes tomorrow, I have my, my leg back tomorrow in glorified form. So, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, understand that and to whom he was talking to because everything else 
we will describe on who are these kind of people whom the kingdom of God belongs to. There was the crowd, but he was speaking to his disciples and says, yours is the kingdom of heaven because you are the one who have come to a point where you're broken in spirit. You no longer attain, try to attain salvation by your own good deeds, but rather you come before the Lord like that man who said, was beating his chest and said, have mercy on me, a sinner. I just want to really emphasize that because a lot of people think of church as you know something that you go to every week, so therefore you're a Christian. Or something that you kind of uh, serve one way or another, so therefore you're a Christian. That's not the case. The, the biblical qualification of a person who will be born again, who belongs the, to the kingdom of God, is one who has repented of his sin. Because unless you come to that point, you will not call on the Savior. Because the, 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 the point is that you will try to attain salvation by your own good work. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of God. I trust that everybody here, no exception, hopefully in prayer, and my heart's desire, like Paul said, is that you have come to repentance. Okay? It's far more than just fellowship. Fellowship is great. But fellowshipping will not bring you and make you enter the kingdom of God. It's repentance. So ask yourself now, Mike, have you actually repented already? Okay, that's very important. So like I said, I'll try to cover half of it today and I'll speed up, but that's the main point of that verse three, the repentant part. Blessed are the poor in spirit for there's the kingdom of God. Then verse four, the second blessed is basically a follow up on that broken in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Mourn, again, repent. That not only do you know, acknowledge that you are broken in spirit and you are evil on your way to hell, but you're actually repentant about it. You are actually coming to a conclusion. By the way, the word repentance is the word metanoia, which also means the change of mind. You change your mind from knowing and thinking that you are that you can make it on your own, by your own good deeds, by your own action, by the things you do or not do. And so you think, well, I deserve heaven now because I am so much this and that. But scripture is very clear. For all have sinned and all have fallen short of the kingdom of God. When a disciple came to Jesus and said, you are a good teacher. And the Lord says, no one is good. God alone is good. Why? Because God's definition of good is different than the definition of you and I. If I ask you, uh, is Pastor Justin good? Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no evil in him. Yeah. Uh, but, but you see, our standard is totally different. God's standard is perfection. A person who will mourn towards his or her sin is a person who understands not only his evilness, not only his deserving of hell, but he understands the holiness of God. The angels of God in Isaiah cried out and says, Holy, holy, holy. The more we understand the holiness and perfection of God, and the more we understand our evilness, the more we will come to a conclusion that we need to repent. Because if you think that there is a, an iota of goodness in us, that would be a problem. You might say, I'm a sinner, but not as bad as... That's a problem. Yes. I think a true believer will mourn every time he sins. Correct. There is a mourning, a continual mourning for sin, but there's a, there's a one-time mourning for repentance for salvation. Because obviously we are in the stage of sanctification, so therefore we need to repent each time we fall into sin. That's Romans 7, right? I want to do good, but the very good I want to do, I do not do, but the evil I want to do, I keep on doing. So that's the conflict. But the repentance for salvation happens once, because you cannot lose your salvation. Once you're saved, no. Once you are truly saved, always saved. Now, the qualification there is truly. Okay? 
truly. So that's why after you mourn for your sins, uh -huh. the next verse uh, it says you will be comforted. Correct. Yeah, because where where will comfort come in here? At the time you repent, but also, what's the main context? In the kingdom of God. The fullness of the comfort that we're going to have is not here. In the future. In the future. The fullness. Remember, our salvation comes in three stages. Remember that? What's the first one? Letter J. Glorification. Glorification. And then finally, glorification. So only at that point are we going to have the fullness of the comfort of life. As Jesus said in the book of John, I came to give you life and life abundantly. Now, when will that happen? In the future. Unless you belong to Joel Austin's church that will say, live your best life now. No, our best life is yet to come. That's why today you can experience, how many of you here do not have any problems? Yes, Anyone? Yes, Jesaja. Yes, Jesaja. Yes, yes, but but he was crying earlier, so he has a problem. He just doesn't know it yet, but he has a problem. He gives his problem to somebody else. Yeah. You, you see, some here's a problem. Sometimes we think of parts of scriptures that the promises are given here on earth. No, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. And that's why even today, we always use the word bless. God bless you. God bless your trip. Uh, what else? God bless, you know, whatever. Here is the thing. If you have come to a point of being a broken spirit, poor in spirit and mourning, you have repented and put your faith in Christ, you don't, I don't even want your blessing. Why? I am already blessed. Let's go. Let's go. Oh, of course, we can do it to one another, you know, for the sake of, you know, being nice people. God bless you. Okay, that, that kind of thing. But even for you, I always say, instead of God bless you, go be a blessing. Why? Because you are now the source of blessing. Ephesians 1. Look at this. Look. Paul and Apostle of Christ, yes, by the will of God, to God's, to God's holy people in Ephesus. These are for the believers. Okay, For the believers. For the holy people in Ephesus. The word holy means separated. Distinct. Separate. The faithful in Christ. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There you go. That's the greeting to the believers in Ephesus. So here. Church in Ephesus. The believers. Here's what I want to tell you. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who? What's the word? Who? Has. What's the word has? Already. Past tense. It already happened. To whom? To whom did God bless? The holy people. To those who are faithful in the Lord. To whom grace and peace has been given. So, so sometimes I wonder. I, I, I hope God will bless me. You got it all wrong. You are already blessed. The problem is your definition of bless is totally different than God's definition of blessing. Many of us, our definition of bless is material blessing. But the definition of Christ of blessing is possession of the kingdom of God. That's the true spiritual blessing. And then look at this. Who has blessed us where? Where? In, and where are we now? In the heavenly realm. Earthly. On the earthly realm. Earthly. We're on earth right now. So the fullness, the fullness of the blessing of God is at a time of, earlier said, unglorified stage. As a matter of fact, it won't happen until Revelation 20, where the Lord's promise is where there will be no more tears and no more pain and the fullness of joy. So, but we are already there. It's like, how would I say? I imagine if there was a news right now and the news came and said, uh, the lotto winning number is one, two, three, four, five. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. And then you check your, your lotto number and you check, 
One, two, three, four, five. Same number. Bingo. <laughs> Question. When do you start rejoicing? When you get when you receive the money. When you receive the money. Yeah. Really? Yeah. At that point, when you go one, two, three, four, five, exactly the same number. Yeah. When you realize you won. When you realize you won. That's the problem with many Christians. They have not realize the blessing that they have in Christ. They do not realize that heaven belongs to them for six months. For how long? Ever. 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 As long as they are. Eternity. How long is eternity? Forever. Now, do you understand why the Lord is... Uh, in a way, speaking to his disciples and saying, look, you are the people who are truly blessed. Why are you so worried that people are trying to hate me and therefore hate you? Uh, in the book of John, as they have hated the master, they will hate you also. Now, it's easy for us to follow Christ, declare Christ when things are okay. But when things go wrong, please remember this. You are truly blessed. It doesn't matter what happens to you. Are you getting into bankruptcy? Jean. Yeah. You see, what Jean is saying here, that the source of our true joy, of true blessedness, of true happiness, is the realization of what we already have in Christ. Not what we are going to have in Christ, but what we have already in Christ. You already have the exact number. One, two, three, four, five. Okay? Panalo ka na. You are a winner. It's just a matter of time for the claiming of the fullness of it. So, blessed are you if you are broken in spirit. Blessed are you if you mourn about it. For they will be comforted that they would come Every single problem you have, list it down right now. Okay, in a hundred years, I'll tell you none of them will exist anymore. None of them, zero. You won't even probably remember it. Are you hearing me? Amen. You see, sometimes in churches, I see those posters that says "Bawal na kasi maangot." Have you seen that? That gorilla uh, it says "Bawal na kasi maangot." But here's the truth. What's... Sorry, sorry. Baka kailangan mo ng paa. Ah, oh, no, no, no. I, I'm good. Th thank you. Paaba ni Bingo mo. Patapatungan eh. Oh, oh yun, yun, yun. Yung, yung pangpatong ng paa. <laughs> Hindi pa ng paa, ng leg pala. But thank you, thank you. Um, well, no, nawala ako. Um, no. Those who mourn. Ha? Huh? Those who mourn. Yeah, those who mourn. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes we, we tend to try to project it just by the act of the will. Smile. No, no. The true joy of not, not being nakasimangot is the realization and the understanding of what you possess. Are you hearing me? Exactly. You need to understand what you possess in Christ. Because until you understand that, all the problems of this life is going to overtake you. Yeah. So, again, uh, the reality is this, that even people who are in Christ do not get to have the full understanding of this. And I think the Lord is just trying to really emphasize this to kind of dig in in the minds and hearts of his disciples, the true believers in this case, that they are the they have all the reasons in the world to be truly happy. Yeah. I remember another, another verse in Ephesians. Remember the problem in Ephesians? Ephesians 4. Oh, not, not, Philippians 4. The, the chapter on prayer, Philippians 4. The background on Philippians, 
the Philippines is a poor church. And they're experiencing trouble, persecution, imprisonment, and some have already died. So Paul writes them and tells them, starting let's start with verse 4. Let me take out this. Verse 4, where are you? Okay. Here's the advice of Paul to people who I can almost picture nakasimangot. I mean, if you have problems and you have issues in life, then the tendency is to um, you know, not be rejoicing. But here's what Paul says. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Now, that's a commandment. That's not a suggestion. That's in the imperative. You must be rejoicing. You must be this. Well, why? Well, most likely they were not rejoicing. Most likely they were worried. Most likely they were afraid. Most likely they were just concerned about the future or even the present. But Paul says rejoice. And then the next line is very important. Your joy, let your gentleness be. What's that? To be shown. To be a testimony. You see, the joy that we have is not superficial. It's, it's coming from internal. How can you have an evidence of joy if it's not coming from the internal? Then you are a hypocrite. You know, I remember Arela and Joshua when they were young. And I'll take their picture. They're kind of, you know, their faces just kind of... When you say one, two, at the count of three, automatic smile. Make believe. Yeah. Because they were trained to do that. But it's not necessarily that they were truly smiling. They were just trained to be smiling. There are Christians who are trained to be nice. But they're, they're not really nice. Some Christians were taught to be oral people. But they are actually immoral people. <laughs> the source must be internal. And who is this coming from? From those who mourn from their evilness. And those who have come to repentance and has a broken spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of God. For they will be comforted. So is the Lord done with his disciples. Speaking about those things. No he's not. The disciples are starting to smile a little bit. But not fully yet. So let's see. The Lord says. First is. Those are poor in spirit. There is the kingdom of God. Blessed those who mourn, they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Who are the meek? The humble. Who are the humble? Those who mourn and those who have poor in spirit. Remember, the context is about the kingdom of God. That those who belong to the kingdom of God are people who have humbled themselves before God. That they would actually come to the Lord and say, I'm a sinner. You see, it's one thing to be mourning and repentant, and that's it. But it's another thing to actually come before the Lord and humble yourself. You are right, and I'm wrong. You are right, God, and I'm wrong. Your ways are higher than my ways, and your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. You see, it, it, really the people who are not humble... A good example are the Jews. Romans 10. Because sometimes we are overtaken by religiosity without humbling ourselves before God. You're very familiar with this verse. Romans 10. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God, to the Israelites, so his heart desire and prayer to the Israelites, is that they may be saved. Which means? They are not saved. They are not saved. Now, why is it his desire and prayer for the Israelites to be saved? For, that's because, I can testify about them that they are? Wow, they are super religious. They are godly. But they are not saved. Don't fall into the trap. To being godly, to being religious, but not saved. You can do all the kinds of ministry you want. But if you have not come to a point of repentance and mourning, and in this point, humbling yourself, you're not saved. Yeah, 
A good example of that is JWs and Mormons. Uh huh. Yeah. They have a lot of zealousness. Yeah. Correct. But it's based on wrong. Wrong doctrine. Yeah. But I'm afraid, Pastor. Not only the JW or Mormons, that there are a lot of people in evangelical churches who think that they are, but are not. And they think that they are because they are zealous. But here's the problem. For I can't testify that they are zealous for God, but, what's that word, but? Pero, I'm not talking about the but, okay? There's a single T. Single T. But their zealousness, their religiousness, their zeal is not based on knowledge. Not, not based on truth. Not based on what God wants. You see, it's not even understanding. You see, a person doesn't understand is excuse. I didn't understand. But that's not the problem. The problem is this. Since, that's because, they did not, what's that? Did not know the righteousness of God. If you put a period there, they did not know, then oh, no wonder they did not know. But that's not the problem. The problem is this. Why did they not know? They did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own. Yun ang problema. They are being creative. You, you see, zealousness, you could be, uh, what, what did they say? Uh, you could be sincere, but sincerely wrong. Well, for example, most of us, if not all of us, came from the Catholic background. Yes. And in Catholic system, for example, we were taught, taught that, you know, if you do the rosary and kneel from point A to point B, you're really, you know, you're really bad. Really? Where did that come from? It's not from the knowledge of truth. Now, why did you not know? Because you didn't want to find out. You were content with just going there, doing this and doing that, and then do your own thing. As Jesus said to the Pharisees and Sadducees, you will die in your sin. And not just that, look at this. So it's not that they didn't understand. They didn't understand because they want to establish their own. And here's the worst thing. They did not submit to God's righteousness. In other words, they have the source to find out what, where the truth is. They could actually uh, uh, find out. And as a matter of fact, they already know. The problem is they didn't want to submit. They want to do their own thing. They want to do their sacrifice. Isn't that true? That we want to do I want to sacrifice this. I want to give more. I want to, as if it's pleasing to the Lord. Yes. But in the book of Psalms, it says, obedience is better than? No. Obedience is better than sacrifice. But we, we somehow want to sacrifice. Lord, let me sacrifice. No. You just obey. It's better than sacrifice. Jesus said, He who loves me obeys me. <laughs> now, obedience can can make a sacrifice, but it's the obedience, not just our sacrifice, not any sacrifice. Not our sacrifice. Another one. Uh, um, Romans 12. Remember, this is all in the context, okay? In uh, chapter 12 of Romans. And many of you have gone to the book of Romans. Um, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, what should you do? To present yourself. In view of God's mercy. That's number one. In other words, in the light of understanding what God has done for you. So what, did, what did he do to you? Well, number one, he took your sin from you and he nailed it on the cross. You and I, who deserves to go to hell, who deserve to be tormented for eternity, Jesus took it upon himself. There's what you call Theologically, okay, uh, take note of this. Theologically, let's go doctrines for a while. It's called uh, double imputation. Why double imputation? The first, the word imputation is to put in, to give to. The first imputation is this: Christ took your sin and put it upon Himself. 
That's the first invitation. By dying on the cross, he paid the penalty of sin and therefore received the righteousness of God. That righteousness is given to those who have repented and put their faith in Christ. Imputed in you. That's the second invitation. Got it? So that's called double invitation. He took up our sin upon himself and he gave his righteousness to you and I. That's why the Bible says in Romans 5, who those who have been justified are now friends, no, not of God, with God. Why? Because once upon a time, we were enemies of God. So, you know, sometimes we say, you know, God loves you. That's not true. If you're not in Christ, God hates you and will send you to hell for eternity. No, obviously, that's scripturally, but you don't go around and just say, you know, God will. But, but that's what it is. You are an enemy of God at the point when you are not in Christ yet, you're an enemy of God. You are the child of the devil. You belong to your father, the devil. That's why they always say that the gospel is offensive. That's why people who preach the gospel will be hated by the world. So, okay, um, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. The offering of the body of our, of our bodies as a living sacrifice is after we understand what Christ has done for you and I. The realization. And that offering of our bodies as a living sacrifice is something that happens somehow automatically if you truly understand what Christ has done for you. It's natural to offer everything you've got for the purpose of the kingdom of God. And then that kind of sacrifice is holy and pleasing to God. So what kind of what kind of sacrifice is pleasing? The one whose source is understanding the mercies of God. If you do not understand what God has done for you and what and where God has taken you out from, from the pits of hell, from the grip of Satan, then your sacrifice doesn't amount to anything. The sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God is one who is coming from a true worshiper. He offers his life, his body, as a living sacrifice. You know, that's very important because back then in the Old Testament, their sacrifices are all dead. A dead lamb, a dead sheep, a dead dove, a dead... But now he's saying your life, the way you live your life today, on the presumption that you truly understand, have mourned, and you have a broken spirit and put your faith in Christ, that life that you're living now for Christ is the one that is pleasing and acceptable to God. Then the last line on that verse, this is your true and proper worship. Again, many Christian things of worship as in when feel the feel good like, oh, you know, maybe there's goosebumps because there is a lot. Oh, I'm going to talk about music. Well, that's true. That's worship. But true worship is a day to day, minute by minute, moment by moment. What you do today here in your Bible study and what you do at home, in your office, and wherever you are, that is what makes it pleasing and acceptable to God. And where does it come from? Where does it start? The brains. Verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. You see, the battleground is your mind. What you do in an everyday basis is because what your mind is trained to do since wherever, you know, whenever, you know, since you started life. Whatever program. That virus has to be taken out. So, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be Transform how by the renewing of your mind. Hopefully, you and I are here in the Bible study not to become a Christian. I hope you already are. You are here because it is for the purpose of the word to sanctify our minds 
to renew it and to be transformed it in the pattern of God's ways. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. That's just how it is. It's to the word. You cannot be creative on how to, how to please God. And if you are in Christ, again, the Lord is saying in the book of Matthew, you are the truly best people because you are the ones who are truly pleasing God. And you are the ones who are truly worshiping God. That's why in John 5, was it? Uh, the Samaritan woman, the Lord says that they will come, that the true worshiper will no longer go to this mountain or that mountain, but they, they are the ones who will worship in spirit and in truth. In truth. And what's the truth? The word of God. So, let me go here. So, blessed are you if you are broken in spirit, if you have mourned, if you are meek, for they will inherit the kingdom. You have humbled yourself. Now, many people say, what, what do you mean by inherit the, the earth? Well, the context again is the kingdom of God. When are we going to enter the kingdom of God? Well, right now, we already are uh, citizens of heaven, correct? There'll but a new her, new earth. Revelation 20. When this old earth is melted down and the new heavens and new earth and the new Jerusalem comes down, they are the people who are who have mourned, who have repented, and those who are poor in spirit, they are the ones who will fill the earth for eternity. The Bible tells us that the residence of God where? Heaven. Right now, in heaven. But when this happens, the new earth, the Bible says in Revelation 20 that God will move his address from where he is right now to the new Jerusalem here on earth. So if you want to go to heaven, you'll be left there alone. Okay. He is the one moving to where we are, the new heavens and new earth. So we'll, we'll study it when we get to the book of Revelation. But those are the promises. So he he was telling disciples, disciples, you must start to feel the the anger of the people now. Uh, you might feel some sort of regret for following me now. But you are the most happy people. You're the blessed people. So, and who are again? Who are these kind of people? Verse six: Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. You see, ultimately, a person who is repentant is one who seeks the righteousness of perfection of God. He understands that his righteousness, his goodness is bokya. Because a person who thinks that his righteousness is fairly good, not as bad, uh, okay, okay lang, then... <laughs> You you are you are not you don't you have a very poor definition of righteousness, because God's righteousness can only be attained by imputation from the Lord, and that imputation only happens to those who have repented and put their faith in Christ. Again, our our definition of righteousness today is mabait. Oh, he's righteous. You know why? Because you did not see him cheat. Because you didn't see him still. Because you do not know what's going on in his mind. That's why Jesus made it very clear. You might not have had physical adultery, but in your mind, you have committed adultery. In your anger, you have murdered. Now, how many of you here are not murderers? By Christ's definition of murder. See? Because our definition is different than the Lord's definition. Our, our definition of good is you know, more by it, comparing to a lot of other evil people. But in definition of God is perfection. No one is good. Paul clarifies that in Romans 3. No one is good. Not you, not your pastor, not your churchmate, not your Bible study group, not the priest, not the Pope. Nobody is good. Per definition of God's goodness. For all have sinned and all have fallen short. So better those who are poor uh, or hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they will be filled. They will be comforted. They will inherit the kingdom of God. 
So he was talking to his disciples, look, you are not content on the goodness of you. You are the ones who will ultimately uh, fill the earth. You are the one ultimately who will be contented. You will be the one who will ultimately be filled and be uh, uh, contented. So, because why again? Because everything that you're going through right now, the things that you're experiencing because of your attachment to me, because of your relationship with me, it's all going to fade away. It's going to all be gone. As a matter of fact, if we go back to the book of Philippians earlier, uh, it says, uh, rejoice in the Lord always. Say it again, rejoice. Uh, make evident your gladness. And then he says next, for the Lord is near. For the Lord is near. So whenever you come to a point when you say, you know, life is really hard, life is really difficult, life is very challenging, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, you know, preach to yourself and say, the Lord is near. The Lord is near. I promise you, with all of these people here, uh, it looks like 50 years from now, we are all gone. <laughs> we're all done yeah. on, the, on the presumption that you are really healthy no accident and you do your exercises and everything oh yeah, oh, yeah Josiah okay I forgot Josiah oh by the way but there's still no promise 50 years yeah Remember what Jesus says to that uh, rich man? When the rich man said, oh, I'll build barns tomorrow. I'll go on a cruise and I'll go on vacation. No, what did the Lord say? You fool! Tonight, Tonight you're gone. Bangungut ka ngamaya. Now, this one is very important. Next one. And this is now. So verse uh, 4 to verse 6 speaks about what has happened to a true believer? The next verses will speak about what are the expectations of a true believer? What are the fruits of a true believer? Let's see. Let's start here. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Very important. And Jesus put this as the first of the list for those who have mourned and for those who have repented or broken in spirit. He says, that person is one who is merciful. Well, what is merciful? Graceful. Forgiving. Forgiving. Now, it is very ironic. Remember earlier, it says, in view of God's mercy, Romans 12, Romans 10. In, uh, yeah, in Romans 12. Uh, in view of God's mercy, that means you understand what you have been forgiven from. And you will only understand and mourn about it if you understand your evilness. If you think you are good or better than somebody else, that's a big problem. Even there was nobody else here on earth, you alone, nobody to compare with, you are evil. And unless you understand that and the holiness of God, and he has forgiven you by grace, not because you deserve it, not because you have worked for it, just purely because of the goodness of God. If you understand that, then God has extended and given you mercy. Okay? They say, here's the definition, that the three words that are very close to one another, justice, mercy, and grace. Justice is getting exactly what you deserve. Okay? If you need to be put to jail, to be just, you must be put to jail. Mercy is this. Not getting the bad you deserve. So you're supposed to go to jail, but say, okay, well, you know, uh, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay, just don't do it again. Okay? That's mercy. Grace is getting the good you do not deserve. Not only are you not put to jail, now they'll give you house and lot. Okay? You do not deserve. So, God has extended us mercy. 
He did not give us the hell that we do not deserve. And those who receive that mercy, they will be shown mercy. Okay? Uh, better are the merciful than for other people. Let me find for the other verse. What's that? In the book of Matthew, I believe, where it says, um, does anyone know that the slave person who was forgiven? I'm running out of time here. Come on. Uh, uh, give me a... When the king forgave the slave, but the slave did not forgive the, the fellow slave. Um, what's the word? Um, ay, ay, ay. I'm looking for uh, slave... Um, did not forgive. Uh, something like that. Fell a slave verse. You see, by the way, if I look for verses, I always use Google uh, to, to search for a particular verse. Come on. Where is it? What verse is it? Uh, Matthew 18. Okay. Matthew 18. That, that's the way I look for a verse. Sometimes I know the verse. I don't know exactly where it is. I just use Google to look for it. Okay. The parable of the unforgiving. Matthew 18. Yeah. Okay. So let's go. Matthew 18. This is a. Sometimes we love to claim to be to have received the forgiveness of God. But we want that. Oh, I, I'm forgiven. Yeah. Now I have a reason for living. You know that song? I'm forgiven. But there are people who sing that song who only presume that they are forgiven, but they are not. Because the, one of the characteristics of a person who have truly mourned, who have truly, who have truly been, uh, uh, been broken in spirit, is mercy. Uh, verse 30. Okay, verse, let's start with verse. Uh, come on. Um, where does it begin? Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Therefore, let's start with there. That paragraph. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven, huh? The kingdom of heaven. Remember earlier we were talking about the kingdom of heaven. So, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants, as he began the settlement. A man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since the man was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children, all that he had to be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. What's that? Mercy. So the slave who owed 10,000 bags of gold was has received mercy. 28. But when the servant went out, oh, he's joyful. I, have, I no longer have utang. No more utang. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to the knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the, the debt. When the other servants saw what he had what had happened, they were outraged and fell and went and told their master about that had happened. Then the master called the servant. servant is, you wicked servant, he said, I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy? On your fellow servant, just as I had on you. In anger, his master handed him over to the jailer to be tormented until he should pay back all he owed. He is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Now, what is the characteristic of a true believer? Forgiving. He, he has a new concept, a new understanding of forgiveness. He, he or she is now 
more merciful and understanding of other people. Knowing, knowing and understanding that he himself has received mercy and forgiveness from God that he does not deserve. Maybe we should stop at that and we'll continue the other half next week. But the first characteristic, and very important characteristic as we will go to the following verses, is that do you find yourself as a person who has changed in the way you forgive other people? Because you might just be presuming you're a believer. You might, you might not fully understand the forgiveness that God has given you. You might not have understood the evilness of you. Maybe you're still at a point where you're saying, well, you know, I'm a sinner, but I'm not as bad. Because only people who understand the forgiveness of God towards him are the people who will inherit the kingdom of God. And it's proven as you see yourself being more forgiving of other people. Now, can we totally forgive other people? Sometimes not. We are still in the process of sanctification. But it is one area that should be growing on a regular basis. You know, we might have people who have hurt us in many ways. Uh, maybe debts that was not paid to you. Maybe an uh, insult that you get. Maybe you have been bullied uh, uh, when you were young. And, and so on. Whatever you may be going through. And you're still holding that grudge until today. Well, the Lord is saying and reminding you, you might have forgotten how much you owed me and that I have forgiven you in view of God's mercy. Okay? And once you let go of that, this is your true and pleasing worship acceptable to God. Isn't that amazing? Obedience is better than sacrifice. Okay, let us, um, what time is it? Let me see here. Yeah. So we have 25 minutes for Q&A. We'll, we'll, continue, we'll continue with the half of the Beatitudes next week. Okay. So you see, it's one thing to break down the Beatitudes one verse at a time and speak about, you know, how blessed are the you know mourners. Well, Really what he was trying to describe are people who are in Christ, those who have mourned. And we're going to conclude it next week as a whole package. As a whole package, the Beatitude. Okay, let's open up uh, in Q&A. Question, comment, clarification. Anyone? Yes, my comment here. Comment. Yeah, who's that? Yes, Joe. Hello? I think Cora spoke first. I mean, I declare. I declare he just spoke first. Go ahead, Ate. Liz? Okay, Liz? No, Clarissa. Clarissa. Liz? You know, who's Liz? Both of the Liz are here. Lisa. No, uh, Connie? Anyway, whoever you are, go ahead and speak, please. It is here. It is. Thoughts, questions? Oh, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, I have three observations yeah, what is it? for this. Uh, number one, the first four Beatitudes have a vertical uh -oh. orientation with a God-centered orientation. The rest of them have a horizontal orientation uh -huh. about how to relate Correct. to others. Second observation, the Beatitudes are an invitation to a life of discipleship. Now, it's not easy to Correct. follow Jesus. Correct. It will involve a life that pursues humility, justice, and peace. It will be costly, but it will be so worth it. You will yeah. have what matters most. You will flourish. Yeah. You're better off being a disciple, even if it costs. It's more than worth it, Correct. both now and for eternity. The third observation is... We have in the Beatitudes a picture of Jesus. There's not a single one of these Beatitudes that you don't find in Jesus. He doesn't just invite us. He models it himself. Yeah. And, and by the way, the Beatitudes, as it is written, is not a commandment. It's a statement. <clears throat> it's a statement that those who have mourned and those who have broken spirit 
and those who have humbled themselves in God, this is the produce. Much like the fruit in John 15, the fruit is not something you, you do, but it's something that bears out because you are in the vine. And the first one here of being merciful is one of those fruit that is evident and is a characteristic of those who have mourned and those who have broken spirit. Yeah. Okay. So, yes, we need to work on the sanctification side of trying to be more fruitful, but all at the same time, it is a produce of those who are in the branch. Yes, sir. Uh, mercy is not something that comes from within you. You are just a medium or a conduit of God's mercy. Correct. Yeah. Uh, Pastor Jay was saying here that mercy is really a fruit of the understanding that of what God has shown to you. Okay. So, yeah, it, it, that's very, very important. And, it, you know, in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, it says, Check and see if you are truly in the faith. Well, one way of checking it is, well, have you been more merciful now? Do you have a better understanding of what God has forgiven you from? You might think, well, you know, I'm not that bad anyway. Well, for the wages of? Sin. Of what? Sin. Singular. Sin. One. It only takes one. It only takes one. And God has forgiven you from eternity in hell. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I am bothered to think that, like, in the Philippines. In the Philippines? Uh, yeah, I'm having the house built, right? And mm -hmm. I ordered the, the windows, the glass doors and windows. Uh -huh. I'm supposed to deliver May 2nd. Okay. Because I'm living May 15, right? Okay. And they haven't delivered it. And I can't help it but get angry about it and feel like I need to yeah. be justified. Yeah. So what's the question? Am I, am I being, I'm not, am I not being kind? Merciful. Well, <laughs> I, I, I think, um, okay, the, the issue here is uh, uh, Eugenia ordered a window for her house uh, in, where's that, Laguna, uh, at a specific date because she's coming back to the U.S., but the promise did not happen. So yeah. does she have the right to be angry? Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, but what I is was saying a witness. here is that... I don't know. Yeah, she knows. She knows. I was uh, a she witness. Knows? Okay. <laughs> yeah. But, but I think uh, the word mercy is, is a graduation from... You see, even Jesus was merciful, turned tables. Okay. Because there is what you call uh, godly... Uh, I think you lost the internet. Yeah, it's open on the internet over there. I think the internet went down over there. Can anyone else hear me? No more. It's connected. Ross, can you hear me? I can, I can hear, you. hear you. Okay. If you need your mic, I cannot go uh, and try to log back in. Well, while we're waiting for uh, them to reconnect, I sent them uh, a 
a message on uh, Messenger. But in each of these Beatitudes... Oh, there, there you go. There you go. I'm sorry. I forgot to turn on the microphone um, and the video. But uh, uh, the computer died. So uh, it has to be born again. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Mike. Yeah. Uh, so I, I was just answering Eugenia's question. You, you can charge it anywhere else. I won't be using it here anymore. You can charge it anywhere. Uh, and, uh -oh. Okay. Yeah, the computer died, so I was using battery. Oh. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Mike. Yeah, go ahead. So in each one of the Beatitudes, the Greek word being used here is makarios, which means receiving uh -huh. favor of God. So you could translate, you could change the word blessed as to receiving the favor of God are those, and the Greek word for poor is patokos, which, which translates to a uh, poor beggar person or a few resources, but it's not uh, the poor in spirit is not lacking in spirit, but have the positive moral quality of humility, realizing they have nothing to offer God, but are in need of his free exactly. gift. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. Okay, everybody, kitchen people, kitchen people, we're not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> Anymore? Have mercy, have mercy. Uh, yeah. Sharon's yeah. already started. <laughs> what, what's the question? Uh, it's more of remember that oh, big, Romans yeah. 12, uh -huh. one, uh -huh. music of mine. Because a lot of, I mean, I should not trade it. A lot of believers re presume that renewing is every Sunday or every prayer meeting. Yeah. yeah. The context is renewing is every second, every minute, and every day. Exactly. That's the same. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's why. What did Jesus say to the Samaritan woman? The day will come that you don't worship in this mountain or that mountain. It's not a specific time or a specific place, but rather you will be worshiping in spirit and in truth. That's a daily basis. That's an every moment of your life. You worship Him when you cook. You worship Him when you go to your office. You worship Him when you are with your friends. You worship Him. Whatever it may be. Yeah. In view of God's mercy. So I just want to kind of maybe possibly wrap this up a little bit. The first point that I really want to emphasize here is what is the true, who is the true blessed person? I Quote unquote, I don't care what you're going through right now. If you are in Christ, you are an inheritor of the kingdom of God for eternity. You are going to live with God forever. You will, there will come a point in your life when there will be no more tears and no more pain. You will have a glorified body. You will have all the joy that God provides for eternity, forever and ever and ever and ever. So whatever you're going through right now, Jean, so Yes. So, but meanwhile, while he, we are here on earth, scripture says that we are to encourage one another with the word of God. We are to inform and uh, disciple one another for the purpose that we might understand and make it a realization in our life of what God has done already. Already. Okay. Thoughts, Norman? Anything to say? Uh, when you say uh, pray without ceasing, is that the same as pray without ceasing? Okay. Again, you're every day, daily, daily, right now. Yes. One question about you could not tell to people God loves you to anybody. Well, I'm not, I'm not saying you cannot, but I think we need to under have a better understanding of what it means God loves because the love of God are only for those whom He will bring to Him for eternity. And right now, people are enemies of God if you're not in Christ. That's why in Romans 5, it says, for those who are in Christ has become the friends of God, which means prior to that point, you were enemy of God. Okay? But today, we want to make all people feel good. That's our problem. 
But theologically, we have to understand that people whom God loves are those whom will be with him. There is a general kind of love that God has for all people. John 3, 16. For God so loved who? The world. That's everybody. But the question is, what kind of love is that? Sometimes we say, oh, it's agape. It's a, you know, unconditional. Got it all wrong. It's unconditional at this specific way. For God to love the world, that, not yet, that he gave his one and only son. So how does God love the whole world? By giving it to everybody. That is unconditional. It doesn't matter who you are, what color you have, what religiosity you have, what nationality you have. God loves you and God presented his son to everybody. That's how God loves you. But salvation and love is different. For whosoever believes in him will not perish. Which means that those who will not believe in him will, will perish. So you see? Again, here's where we have to get the whole context of the whole verse. Because if we only take for God to love the world, we, God loves you. Question is, in what way? He's giving you his son, and that if you accept his son, you will not perish. But if you don't accept his son, you will perish. So in that way, it is agape, unconditional to everybody. But salvation is only to those who believe, which comes, by the way, at next verses. Uh, John 16, you go to 17, 18, 19. To those who believe in the Son, is saved. And to those who do not, is not saved. So you see? Again, context. Very important. Because the word yeah. love is, uh, no, it can be many ways. I, I can say to everybody here, that I love you. Yeah, but in a certain way. So you have to understand what context is it that I'm saying I love you. The Greek translation uh, online, of love is perfect love, uh, not unconditional. The Greek translation of agape is perfect love. Perfect it, love, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. not unconditional love. It's perfect love. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. You can also use unconditional, but the con the unconditional is conditioned. The, yeah. the unconditional love is for the purpose that the the offering of the death of forgiveness of Christ on the cross is offered to everybody, unconditional. That's how God loves everybody in the world. But the love he has for the believers are only for those who have mourned, broken spirit, and humbled himself before the Lord. Because the perfect good. love of Christ is like a father's love for children. It's just love Correct. Too. God loves his children, but only after you have become a child. Because if you're not a child, you're a child of the devil. John 8. Okay. Any more? Online? Anybody else there? Ross? Ben, good to see you. Uh, who else? Connie? Loy? Connie, you're quiet. Anybody else? Why is there no more question? They're all scholars. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Okay, why don't, if that's the case, we, we, let's close. Uh, for sure, no more question, comment. Ross, anything on your side? Oh, no question. No question? Okay. Announcement here. Uh, in, a, in a little bit. Okay. Uh, let's close. Uh, no, finalize first. Every Joel, anything? You've been very quiet. No. So let me just say this. Okay. Uh, yes. What's that? What I'm trying to say about that, God, God loves you. Like when we approach someone who is, we're trying to 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 share the salvation. Uh huh. Can I use that as a start? Well, I learned that from someone, and say you can say. God loves you and this and that. Would that be like? Sure, you can, but you have to put. The, you have to put the condition. Uh, John three nine. Yeah. You want to say that? And yeah. what does John three nine says? It says well, God so loved the John three sixteen. John three sixteen. John 3, 16. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you can say to people, God loves you. That He is offering His salvation to you, so it's conditional. Conditional. If you believe. Yeah. And if you believe. You will not perish. 
Yeah. yeah. Because because sometimes we 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 love to use verses that are incomplete. Yeah. 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 That's we don't why. want to the offensive parts to people because we don't want them to get angry with us or turn away. We want to win them over. Yeah. yeah. But, but that's why I, good. the gospel is offensive. Because you really have to point out to a person that he is evil, he's on his way to hell, and he is still an enemy of God. Or I, can I say that if you don't give Jesus, you're going to hell? Exactly. Yeah. But you can say it in a nice way. <laughs> How? That's not you. you won't go uh, to hell. Well, you have to, for example, you do not zero in on him. You can say, you know what? We are on our way to hell. We don't believe in God. By including yourself, you're not segregating yourself to be somebody who's better than her or him. Okay. Now, I know we're talking about this, but the main point is when Jesus was talking to the disciples, the disciples were worried about life. They were worried that they are being now persecuted, the beginning of the persecution. And the Lord is reminding them, guys, you might understand this. You have just won the lotto. The numbers you have, one, two, three, four, five, is exactly what came out. You are blessed. You are the truly blessed people. We'll help you uh, 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 go to the bumps of life. We are all going to the bumps of life. Yes or yes? Yeah, we're all going to the bumps of life. And unless you understand the goodness and the mercies of God, if you don't have the proper view of your eternity, which is in the heavenly realms, then you'll have all the worries of life. And by the way, in the book of Matthew, now it is a command. Do not worry. Yes. That's a command now. Yeah. Amen. So let's close. Let's close. Father, we thank you for your word. Indeed, Lord, it's a good thing to understand that we are the truly blessed people. Those who have repented, put their faith in Christ, knowing that we are evil. We deserve hell. And yet, because of your mercy and of your grace, you have forgiven us and not give us the, the bad, the torture of eternity in hell. You, you took them out. You took us out of it. And more so, you have promised us the, the eternity, the abundant life that is yet to come, that we will be fulfilled, that we will be content, and that there will be no more pain and no more, uh, and we'll feel of joy. And whatever we are lacking today on this earth, Lord, will fully be fulfilled at that time. Living with you, talking with you, uh, sitting with you, rejoicing in you. Lord, may that reality be more and more in each of your disciples, of your two disciples. Uh, to those who have mourned and those who have been broken in spirit, for they are the people who belong to you. Theirs is the kingdom of God. So we thank you, Father, for your word tonight. And thank you for sanctifying us a little bit more today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mike. Okay, all right. Thank you, people. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Oh, announcement. Who was that who was going to give an announcement? Cora. Today. As far as Sister Rima and Sister Ludi. Sister Rima, yeah. Ludi and Rima. So what's the announcement? Sister Brad, I mean, uh, will, and Cora will uh, buy over us and Jill. Okay, the, the celebrant of June. To share $100 each to be, um, to buy lechon and roast beef. Woohoo! <laughs> to buy lechon. At Rima's house. Oh, at Rima's house. Ah, okay. So, Sorry, online people. It's only good for the, the people here. Uh, the celebrants of June is going to buy lechon uh, on June 9 for us. Okay. We're all Goodbye, everybody. On we'll see you for the lechon. Uh, Merly, get well soon, Merly. Thank you. I'm okay. I'm okay now. All right. Bye. Okay.